Can Christians follow the gospel of Jesus and the law of Moses at the same time? Recently, Rob Solberg, an outspoken critic of pronomian, that is pro-law theology, made a video where he argued that we cannot. I responded to that video and demonstrated why none of Solberg's arguments actually prove his case. Solberg didn't like my video and made another video objecting to my critiques. So this video is my response to his response. In this video, we will primarily be addressing Solberg's claim that I mischaracterized his position on the law. Then we'll talk about some of his other arguments after that. Let's dive in. Solberg spends the first 20 minutes of his video accusing me of mischaracterizing his position on the law. So let's spend some time talking about that. In my previous video, I highlighted that Solberg teaches that following the law of Moses is incompatible with following the gospel. Solberg said that this is a mischaracterization of his position. And the very first thing he says in his video is this. Is the law of Moses incompatible with the gospel? Unfortunately, this opening line telegraphs where his video is headed, which is a largely inaccurate caricature of what I teach. However, as you will see, the only one mischaracterizing Solberg's position is Solberg. Throughout his video, Solberg engages in the fallacy of moving the goalposts. He explicitly argued that Christians cannot follow both the gospel and the law of Moses. It's literally in the title of his video. So in my video, I repeatedly demonstrated that Christians can follow both because the apostles and earliest Christians followed both. So Solberg then argued that he never said Christians cannot follow both, just that it is not required. Here's what he says. For each Old Covenant command that I claim is no longer required, David responds by pointing out that the apostles still did that command, even after Jesus was resurrected. But that line of argument doesn't prove what David thinks it does, because I'm not claiming that these rituals were prohibited or forbidden. I'm saying they're no longer required or necessary. So here Solberg argues that the apostles' obedience to Old Testament laws does not prove that those laws are still required. I would of course argue that their obedience is not what we would expect if they believed those laws were not required, but that's beside the point. That was not Solberg's original argument which I responded to. In his video, he did not argue that Christians are not required to keep God's laws in the Old Testament. He argued that it is impossible for a Christian to keep these laws. He said that a Christian, quote, cannot follow the gospel of Jesus and the law of Moses at the same time. He said to continue to follow these laws renders the blood of Christ, quote, ineffective and unnecessary, and, quote, undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. That was Solberg's original argument. In fact, in his response to me, he goes on to say precisely that. Scripture simply doesn't leave us the option of following both the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus. They're mutually exclusive on at least five points, as we just saw. So there you have it. Solberg thinks that following the law of Moses is incompatible with following the gospel. Again, that was his original argument that I refuted by showing that the apostles and earliest Christians did continue to follow both Jesus and Moses. So Solberg changes his argument back and forth in his own video, and that is just one example. He does this several times, as we will see, but he cannot change change his argument after I refuted him, and then claim that I misrepresented him, and then change his argument back again. That is moving the goalposts. So what is Solberg's position? Well, as we will see, every time he complains that I am arguing against something he did not say, he then goes on to take the very position I argued against. So it's only reasonable to conclude that Solberg, like Andy Stanley and others, does in fact think that following God's laws in the Old Testament is incompatible with the gospel. He does, in fact, think that following God's laws in the Old Testament, quote, dilutes our devotion to Jesus, and he himself admits
admits that I'm far from the only person who has understood this to be his position. When you look at what he has repeatedly said, it's easy to see why everyone thinks that he is an antinomian. As another example, Solberg also takes issue with the characterization that he teaches that Christ abolished the law. He says this, I don't teach that the Torah has been done away with, or that the law of Moses was abolished. But in his book, when commenting on Ephesians 2.15, he literally writes, quote, what do you suppose the phrase the law of commandments expressed in ordinances would have meant to Paul's first century Jewish audience? It is an unambiguous reference to the Mosaic law under which the Jewish people had been living for 1,500 years. And what does the text say Jesus did to that law? He abolished it. So does Solberg no longer agree with what he wrote in his book, or is he, once again, moving the goalposts? Either way, based on what he wrote, it is easy to see why everyone thinks he believes Christ abolished the law. By the way, see this video to learn why Ephesians 2.15 does not say that Christ abolished the law. Finally, Solberg takes issue with people saying that he teaches antinomianism, but in his own video clarifying his position, he says, quote, the law of Moses is not binding on Christians, and that Christians are instead, quote, under the law of Christ. Of course, Solberg thinks the law of Christ is something different from the law of Moses, but as R.C. Sproul points out, Solberg's assertion is the classic definition of antinomianism. By the way, to learn why Christian scholars believe the law of Christ actually refers to the law of Moses, see Todd Wilson's entry on law of Christ in Dictionary of Paul and His Letters. Messianic Jewish scholar David Rudolph argues for this same perspective in his book. Again, based on what Solberg has said and written, it is easy to see why everyone concludes Includes what they do about his position. If he does not teach that the law is incompatible with the gospel, why does he explicitly state that the two are mutually exclusive and that Christians cannot follow both? If he does not teach that Christ abolished the law, why did he write in his book that Christ abolished the law? If he does not teach antinomianism, why does he promote classic antinomian positions like the notion that the law of Moses is not binding on Christians? Anybody who hears these statements from Solberg is reasonable to conclude that my characterization of his position is accurate. In any case, let's move on to some of Solberg's other arguments. First, in his original video, he argued that following the law of Moses, quote, dilutes our devotion to Jesus. I responded by pointing out that Jesus defines devotion to him as keeping his commandments. Solberg responds by arguing that Jesus's commandments are different from those found in the Law and Prophets. The, the New Testament teaches that the ceremonial commands given to the ancient Israelites under the Sinai Covenant do not apply to Christians under the New Covenant. That's why when the resurrected Jesus gave His Great Commission, He didn't say, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe the Law and the Prophets. No. He, in fact, He nowhere commands His disciples to teach the Law and the Prophets. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And again, Jesus nowhere commanded his disciples to teach people to observe the law and the prophets. He just didn't. So two things here. First, Solberg is simply wrong when he says that Jesus never commanded his disciples to teach people to observe the law and prophets. In Matthew 5.19, Jesus admonishes his followers to be great in the kingdom of heaven by doing and teaching the commandments found in the law and prophets. Jesus warns that whoever relaxes even the least of these commandments will be least in the kingdom. Relaxes is the Greek word luo, which is related to kataluo, the word translated a abolish in verse 17. Like kataluo, luo in this context similarly carries the meaning of repeal, annul, or abolish. Essentially, Jesus says that since he did not come to repeal the law's commandments, neither should his followers. Now, some argue that when Jesus said these commandments in verse 19 that he was referring to his own commandments, but the context precludes that notion. As Christian scholar Donald Hagner writes, quote, in keeping with the emphasis of the preceding verses, the least 
least of these commandments is more naturally taken as a reference to the Mosaic Law and the equivalent of the jot and tittle of verse 18. As numerous Christian scholars recognize, Jesus is not giving a new law, but rather giving the definitive interpretation of the Law of Moses. So again, Solberg's assertion is simply false. In Matthew 5.19, Jesus did command his disciples to not only do the commandments found in the Law and Prophets, but also to teach them to others. Second, Solberg points out that Jesus' Great Commission includes teaching the nations all that Jesus commanded. In light of Matthew 5.19, we see that one of Jesus' commandments was to do and teach even the least of the commandments of the Law. Thus, Jesus' command to teach the nations all that he commanded his disciples would include his command from earlier in Matthew 5.19 to do and teach even the least of the commandments from the Law of Moses. Solberg's argument relies on a supposed distinction between Jesus' commands and the Law and Prophets, but as we've seen, the New Testament does not make that distinction. Jesus fully affirms the Law and Prophets and instructs his disciples to teach the nations all he commanded, which includes his command to observe even the least of the commandments from the Law and Prophets. That being the case, Solberg is wrong when he says that following God's commandments in the Old Testament, quote, dilutes our devotion to Jesus. Jesus says the opposite. And I can tell you that yes, trying to keep the Old Covenant law and follow Jesus at the same time does lead to a double-minded pursuit of God. It shifts our attention away from Jesus and toward Moses. So again, I find it strange that Solberg is so astonished by the fact that everyone thinks he believes the law and gospel are incompatible. When he makes statements like this, what else are we to conclude? He says that following God's laws in the Old Testament takes our focus away from Jesus. So essentially, obedience to God's laws in the Old Testament hinders our relationship with Christ. As I've already shown, the New Testament precludes this notion but this is another example of him reaffirming his original argument that I refuted after claiming that I misrepresented him. In this next clip, Solberg responds to my point that the apostles still participated in worship at the temple and animal sacrifices, which refutes his statement that continuing to do those things would render the blood of Christ, quote, ineffective and unnecessary. Here's what he says. He responded by claiming that the apostles still did that ritual, even after Jesus was resurrected. And what you might have noticed about all the temple activity that David just listed is that none of it actually has to do with the annual sin sacrifices. None of the passages David mentioned have anything to do with the atonement sacrifices required in Leviticus 16. Right, none of the examples I gave pertain to Leviticus 16, but they do have to do with atonement sacrifices. The offerings that pertain to the Nazarite vow require a sin offering. So, if Paul was bringing offerings on behalf of the Nazarites in Acts 21, like I mentioned, one of those offerings would have been a sin offering. Does that mean Paul thought Jesus' sacrifice was insufficient to cover his sins? No, because as I explained in my video, which Solberg did not address, animal sacrifices do not accomplish the same thing as Christ's sacrifice. They never took away sin, but instead point to the one who does. They perform entirely different functions. So there is no theological problem with the apostles participating in such activities. Like baptism, Christ's work and the ritual that points to his work are not mutually exclusive. Let's continue. The very act of sacrificing an animal to God today in an effort to atone for our sin would be a slap in the face of the Messiah. It would be an insult to the sinless blood that he shed on the cross for us. And it would be a public declaration that we don't believe his sacrifice was enough. Again, one of the Nazarite offerings is a sin offering. Was Paul insulting the shed blood of Christ? Did he not think that Christ was enough? Solberg needs to do some research on why Christian scholars think the apostles engaging in such activities does not detract from Christ. I've recommended these resources in my previous video, and these would be a great start. In his original video, Solberg argued that we cannot follow the law of Moses because the New Testament identifies all believers as priests. I then demonstrated that the apostles continued to participate in temple worship facilitated by the Levitical priests. So obviously the apostles disagree with the notion that these things are incompatible. Here's how Solberg responds. The point that I made that David agrees with is that the New Testament identifies all followers of Jesus as priests. That was not the case under the Old Covenant. That's a big difference. So the point stands. We can't follow both Moses and Jesus on this issue.
So Solberg is simply wrong here. The Old Testament does identify all believers as priests in Exodus 19. That's the passage Peter quotes in 1 Peter 2, which Solberg cites in his argument to say that Christians are now priests. Again, according to both Old and New Testaments, the notion that all believers function as priests is not incompatible with the ongoing role of the Levitical priesthood. Contrary to Solberg's assertion, Moses and Jesus do not disagree on this issue. The rest of Solberg's video is just more goalpost shifting. He dismisses my arguments about the apostles' continued obedience to the law of Moses by claiming that the apostles' continued obedience does not prove that those laws are still required. Here's another example. For a few years after the resurrection of Jesus, while the temple still stood, temple services were permitted for Christians, but they weren't required. But again, that was not his original argument that I responded to and refuted. His original argument was that obedience to the Torah's commandments regarding the temple service is incompatible with following Jesus. In fact, he goes on to say precisely that within 15 seconds of his previous statement that we just played. So again, the question is, who do we follow? The old covenant law of Moses that requires a physical temple in Jerusalem? or the New Covenant Gospel of Jesus that says, we are now the temple. So again, that is Solberg's actual position, which I responded to and refuted in my previous video. Here's another example. In his original video, he claimed that the command to circumcise your son on the eighth day, quote, undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. I responded by pointing out that the apostles continued to affirm this commandment. So obviously Solberg is wrong that circumcising your son on the eighth day undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. Here's how Solberg Responds. These occurrences of post-resurrection circumcision don't imply that it's still required under the New Covenant, only that it's permitted. But again, this was not his original argument that I responded to and refuted. His original argument was that circumcising your son on the eighth day undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. He said that following this commandment and following Christ are mutually exclusive. But according to the examples I cited in my previous video, those assertions are false. In conclusion, we looked at Rob Solberg's response to my critique of his stance on the compatibility of following the gospel of Jesus and the law of Moses. Solberg's primary objection revolves around the assertion that I misrepresented his position on the law. However, in an effort to escape refutation, we have seen that Solberg merely shifts the goalposts. As we have seen, his initial argument that the gospel and law of Moses are incompatible remains his position, despite his attempts to reframe his argument after the fact, because he repeatedly goes on to then reaffirm his original position. But as we have already seen, the New Testament does not support the notion that following the law of Moses is incompatible with following the gospel. Now, to be clear, I think Solberg is a nice guy, and I don't even know if he realizes what he is doing or how his statements are inconsistent and contradictory, but I did not mischaracterize his position, and I feel like it's a little disingenuous to claim that I did, while then going on to take the very position I argued against. But in any case, I thank him for his response, and I hope to be able to have another live debate or discussion with him sometime in the future, where maybe we can have a productive discussion on the broader topic about whether certain commandments from the Old Testament still apply to us. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. One last thing, be sure to connect with me on my website, davidwilber.com. There you can find a ton of free resources like articles and videos. You can learn more about the books that I've written. Also, if God has put it on your heart, there is an opportunity to throw a couple bucks my way to support my work. Again, thanks for watching this video and I'll see you next time.